Feel free to have a seat. Uh, my name is Chris, and I'm one of the pastors here, and we are overjoyed that you are worshiping with us today. And I, I want to start off with asking a question. Does anyone remember where you were uh, about 11 months ago, New Year's Eve, 20, you know, 2022, going into 2023? You remember where you were? Do you remember how you, you might have felt on New Year's Eve that night? Uh, for us, uh, I have to say, I do remember where we are where this past year. I couldn't probably name about the last 10. Uh, so we had an unexpected uh, dinner invite from some, some friends. That, uh, another couple, I think, that was going out with them had canceled. And so they invited us. And uh, we literally, I think the clock struck. We went to some fancy dinner. And we went. Uh, and right at midnight, I think the clock struck midnight, and we, like, left. Like, because we were, like, way too old for this to, like, be up past midnight. I go to bed at 10 o'clock every night. Uh, but the, the New Year's comes, right, with that, that optimism, that hope of, like, where, what this year could be. It's full of possibilities. And you think back, what were some of those things that you thought was going to happen in 2023? What were those things you were looking forward to? Where did you think you were going to be? This year, I just told Erica this morning, I was looking at the calendar in our kitchen and I was like, gosh, the kids have five days of school left and it's going to be Thanksgiving break and the whole year is going to be behind us before we know it. Where did you expect 2023 to take you? And so today we're going to talk a little bit about what it feels like to not end up where you thought you were going to be, what it's like to have disappointments in your life, to things do not go as planned, and ultimately to answer the question, what do we do when we feel like we're let down by God? And so today we're going to talk about a story that we're going to read again here in a few more weeks. We'll read it again on Christmas Eve. We're going to read the Christmas story from the Gospel of Luke. I think I'm going to take a step back maybe and see if this helps with some of the feedback for us. So we're going to read a little bit from the, the Gospel of Luke, the, 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 one of the greatest stories ever told, a story that you are probably familiar with in Luke chapter 2. So if you've got a Bible with you, I feel free uh, to read along with us. It'll also be on the screen today. So we're going to be starting in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping over, watching over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Anyone need some good news this morning? I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. A Savior has been born. God sends a Savior. If if we were in need of, of, of good advice, God would have sent a counselor. If we needed better laws to follow, God might have sent a politician. If we were in need of better teachings, we would have gotten a teacher. But God sends a Savior. For those that are in need of hope, of redemption, of healing, God sends a Savior. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth. And lying in a manger. And what's what's a sign? A sign is is a thing that points to something else. It's a symbol for something else. And this will be your sign. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. This sign is pointing to something else also in the story of Jesus' life. Wrapped in cloth is how Jesus ended his life. Wrapped in the burial cloths. And a manger, we often think of like the manger that we set out at Christmas, right? And it's like a barn, and we think very kind of American rule barn, 
or with, with cows mooing and stuff. But barns, there's a few different barns uh, in, in uh, this ancient Palestine time. And one of them, and this is actually the, the traditional idea of what a barn would have looked like in Jesus' day. And this is where the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem actually is in the side of a cave that you would have had your, your, your house, your home, and, and you'd have done it nearby to a cave, and it would have been kind of hollowed out, and you'd have kept the animals there at night. And so Jesus here is born, and, and he's wrapped in cloth, and he's in a manger in the side of a cave, just as he was wrapped in cloths and put in a tomb at his death. It's a sign of who Jesus was. That God could have sent a mighty king wrapped in a purple robe with a crown sitting in a palace, but he sends him a baby. This is the kind of kingdom God is talking about here, a baby that's wrapped in the burial cloths, lying in the same place that he would ultimately end up. And then suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace. On earth, peace. We need some of that today, don't we? To those on whom his favor rests. Peace on earth. And if we know anything about this story, there's not much peace that happens immediately, right? There's not much peace that happens. What do you think 2023 was going to look like in your own life? Maybe you've been parenting and you've been doing the best you can and your child just is making bad decision after bad decision and 2023 didn't end up looking like you expected. Or maybe this was the year you, you never imagined 2023 that this would be the year you'd live one more year single. You kept thinking this was going to be the year that you would find somebody. Or maybe you are married and you never imagined that your marriage would be in the place that it is. You never imagined 2023 would be the year that you would have to deal with anxiety and depression. Or maybe you hoped this would be the year that you would have a child, that you would be pregnant. It's not come. And so the story today of the birth of Jesus that we're talking about, you probably have heard a lot of the details. You know, you know the main characters. You know Mary and Joseph, right? And so I we often used to do this. I was a youth pastor for a good number of years. Um, and one of the things that we'd always do when you, tell the, you have the kids uh, try to learn these stories growing, um, growing up is you'd always try to have them modernize the story a little bit. Like you would, you'd give them the Bible. Here's a couple pieces of paper. Uh, divide up. You take a character. You take a character. And, and, and like modernize the story. Usually it always included some sort of rap. The kids would always come back with, with a rap of sorts about whatever Bible story you would tell them. So today, I want to try this out a little bit with us. Uh, if you'll give me a little liberty, I think it'll help us understand the story with a little bit of fresh ears. We're also reading it not at Christmas time, so I think it'll be a little bit more fun to think about the story of Mary and Joseph in some modern terms, if, if you'll give me a little bit of liberty today. All right, so we know. What do we know about Mary and Joseph? They're, they're engaged to be married, right? And this... They've already set a date. It's probably going to be out in the spring. They're thinking May, right? And let me tell you about Joseph's proposal. He had it planned so well. They, they, he had it set out. He packed the picnic basket, had the bottle of wine, had the charcuterie board packed in the basket. He got the blanket. He set it out, and they're right on the shoreline at the Sea of Galilee, right? It was right at sunset. He had, the, he had the photographer planned out. They got that perfect shot. He was right there on the one knee, right? And he got the shot. And, you know, first thing Mary does after she says yes is wants to get that photo and put it on Instagram, right? And she had a record number of likes. She's never had more likes on a photo ever. 
And now they're, they're starting to plan. They're getting excited about the wedding. They're dreaming about that wedding that they had set the date in May. They're picking colors for the wedding. They're pumped up about this. And they've got big plans, right? They've got big plans for what's to come. You know, Joseph, I don't know if you, if you know this, but he, he's a carpenter, and he, he, he's still got some student loans to pay off from going to trade school. And so, you know, they're going to they're gonna live very simply to start off with. They've, they've already planned it. They're going to get an apartment. They're going to save their money to pay off the loans. And then Joseph's pretty good at what he's going to do. And so he's got big plans himself. He's going to start his own company eventually. And when they start his own company and they start making a little bit more money, they're going to start a family. And they've already picked out this, the dream neighborhood that they're going to live in the suburbs of Nazareth, right? And Joseph... <laughs> He's going to build the house. They're going to go like all Chip and Joanna Gaines on building their own house. He's got shiplap and built-ins that are going to be everywhere. And this is the plan that they had for themselves probably, right? Because we've been there. We've had these kind of plans, these dreams of how life is going to go, how the next year is going to go for us. And then this is what happens to Mary, right? In Matthew, it says, This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. She was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And so she has this experience. She's got all these plans, this excitement. She's pledged to be married. They're engaged. And she has this experience with an angel. And the angel's like, you're pregnant, Mary. And she's like, no way, right? Like, I can't be. Like, Joseph and I, we're, we're playing it straight. We're, we're doing all the right things. There's no way. Like, and, it, and the angel's like, no, 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 Mary, you, you don't get this. You're pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And she does all the right things in this moment. You know, she says, God, if this is your will, here I am. I'm your servant. I will do what you ask. She does all the right things in this moment. And she is like on fire for God right now, right? And she runs, and she runs to Joseph probably, right? That's like the next thing. Like after she has this experience, she's got to go tell Joseph. And she comes up to Joseph, I imagine, all like just super excited about what's going to happen. She's going to share this great news. And she comes and she Joseph, you'll never believe what happened. And she begins to tell Joseph, I just saw an angel, and the angel said I was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but if I was Joseph, <laughs> first off, like, you hear this news. Mary's betrayed you now. She's cheated on you. And now she's also maybe a little crazy. Like, what, like what, what are you talking about, Mary? Like, this, this, this is, that's a little strange. And his plans immediately go out the window, right? Because they were pledged to be married together. And so... What Joseph has in mind was, because he was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And so there's, there's kind of two phases of, mar of engagement marriage here um, that are a little bit different than how we understand that, that same season today. And so, and this time Mary and Joseph, when they became engaged, were for all practical reasons, we're, we're married, technically. Um, one of the big things that would have actually happened if, for some reason, Joseph had died during this engagement period, she would have actually, Mary would have been considered a widow. 
Um, and so they were kind of technically legally married at engagement, and then the ceremony was just like really kind of to follow, and all the other things that come with marriage at that point would, would, defo- would follow at the actual ceremony. And so he, you know, wants to do the right thing. And so not only is there the disappointment of the relationship that he feels like he's been betrayed, been cheated on, and now there's also this, this public disappointment, right? The public shame. Mary would have been, for the rest of her life, been an outcast. At this point, she's probably no older than about 15 years old. And he's going to try to do it as quietly as possible to help ease that disappointment, that shame that she would have faced. And you got to say, Mary's done nothing wrong. She did exactly what God asked her to do. She said yes, and she was excited about it, and now she's facing disappointment even again. That Joseph, the one that she loved, is turning her down, is rejecting her. And so there are two things I want to share today of how we deal with disappointments, how we deal with with times of disappointments, things that are, I think will help us understand how to move forward even when we feel like God has disappointed us. The first uh, comes from Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. It says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Many are the plans in a person's heart. I, I don't know if God wrote that for me, but I know how many plans I have in my heart and how many things I think of through the day that might happen, could happen, and should happen, and I plan for those all to happen simultaneously at times, that we have a worst-case scenario, an okay scenario, and a best-case scenario, right? I'm sure that's just me. So the first thing is you don't have to understand the plan to understand the purpose, You don't have to understand the plan to understand the purpose. We can still trust in God's plan even when it's unclear to us because God's character is good. God's character is good, and there is a good plan still. And so we we read on in this story, and it says, But after Joseph had considered divorcing Mary... An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save people from their sins. There. Joseph didn't understand the plan at this point, right? He didn't understand the plan. He didn't understand how Mary could possibly have a baby conceived of the Holy Spirit or what this would look like. He was totally still disappointed that his plans weren't going to work out. He didn't understand God's plan, but he had a purpose here. The child will save his people from their sins. There was a purpose here in this moment. And the second thing is, your disappointment might actually be a divine appointment from God. Often in, our, in my life, there's been those moments where things didn't go as planned, and for one of them, I, uh, I think back to the time when I was in seminary. I accepted a, a call to go into ministry, and I still wasn't real clear about what specifically God wanted me to do. And uh, while, while you're in seminary, uh, I had to do uh, essentially like two internships. So you get sent as a student pastor. Um, I went to seminary in, in North Carolina, and so most of the, the student pastors you got sent to in the summer uh, 
were in rural North Carolina spots where, where there weren't a lot of pastors that people wanted to you know, go to these, serve these churches. They're, they're very small. And in fact, uh, I got sent to, um, the first year I got sent to two churches, two very small churches that I would, would preach at. I'd uh, preach, you know, one service at like nine, driving my car 10 miles on the other side of the mountain and, and uh, preach at the other church. And you kind of when you, in the spring, before that, you get assigned these, these student pastorates for the summer to learn about being a pastor. So these churches are very kind because they get sent 20-something-year-olds that know nothing about being a pastor. Um, they're very sweet people. Anyways, I'm in the meeting with the, the, the woman that's in charge of the program, and she kind of, like, pairs up people, and it's like a big draft board, I imagine, like, of moving people around, of, like, where to send them based on what they want to learn and what kind of these churches. I'm probably giving them too much credit. Um, anyways, I'm in the meeting with the, with the woman, and I'm like, please just, like, let me stay close to, like, the Raleigh-Durham area. Like, I already have my apartment here. I can just, like, stay there over the summer. Um, I don't have to, like, figure out what I'm going to do with my place. Um, just, like, it'll just be a lot easier. Like, I'm not even really sure if I want to go into, like, ministry anymore. Like, we'll see. And God's plan was way different than mine that I wanted in that moment. I got sent to, the, like, the furthest corner. So kind of like Raleigh-Durham's, like, middle eastern part of the state of North Carolina. I, like, I got sent to, like, this, I guess it's on this side of the map for y'all. Like, this far corner over here that, like, touches South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee. I got, like, sent as far away from Durham, like, I could go, possibly. And, like I said, I was serving two churches, um, very small congregations. Most people are, like, we're all over, like, the age of 65 in these, like, rural communities. And it was like nothing. I, I couldn't get any cell service. The church didn't have internet. Like, I literally didn't talk to people for, like, weeks at times. Or I had to drive to, like, this one parking lot in, like, an Arby's to, like, reach. And this is, like, bef- like before iPhones even, really. And it, it was rough, y'all. It was rough. It was not what I wanted to experience that summer, what I imagined, what I hoped for, what I dreamed of my summer was going to look like. But it was there in that community that folks mentored me of what it meant to be a pastor. The first week I was there, someone died, and I had to assist in a funeral, and I sat with a family for an entire day. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was there and present. I preached for the first time that summer, scared, grabbing each sides of this old wooden pulpit as I, like, shook, and I was doing like this as I watched the video later, like, as I was so nervous, swaying back and forth. <laughs> and I, I finished up there, and I was like, man, after that season, I was like, I think I could kind of do this. Like, this might be where God is calling me to be. And I could have rejected it, and I could have said, no, I'm not going not gonna to go there. And I could have packed up and gone on home and not gone to seminary. But I came back that, after that summer, and I met a redhead that was also passionate for Jesus, just like I was. And there's a lot of things in my life because I said yes in that moment. Even though my plans were disappointed, God's purpose was still greater than whatever I could have imagined in that moment. Where are those moments in your life where your plans have been disrupted, they haven't gone as you wanted, they haven't gone as you dreamed, but yet there was still purpose because God's purpose is greater than our plans, even when we can't see it. You don't have to understand the plan. You don't have to understand the plan to trust in his purpose. When we keep reading in this story of Mary and Joseph, Joseph comes around, right? He comes around to the fact that this is their plan. This is their purpose now. And so we, just like that idyllic barn that we have, we have this image of, of Mary and Joseph on the donkey, right? And and Joseph's kind of guiding the the donkey, and Mary's sitting up on it, and it's like a sweet, like, they're just kind of going for a stroll, right, on a little trail ride. But in fact, this would have been about a two-week journey to travel from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. A two-week journey with a pregnant wife on a donkey, right? That sounds like a lot of fun. Like, you know how many red lights he would have ran through on that donkey just to get Mary there a little quicker? I've taken, I took Erica once to Jacksonville when she was about 30-some weeks pregnant. 38. Okay, 38 weeks. And um, needless to say, like, road trip is not super fun. 
with a pregnant wife. So I can only imagine the challenges that Joseph still faced. He didn't have a great plan to get there any quicker, but he trusted in the purpose. And if that wasn't even enough, they're traveling in the winter still. Even in this time, this was, this was, was winter, and it was in a, in a desert. It would have gotten very cold. If you've heard the stories that Jesus tells of, of robbers on roads, there were actually robbers on roads as they people traveled. They would have been a real fear Um, There were animals, the lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, like things would have been out in the wilderness as they traveled these two weeks. There were lots of things that weren't pleasant on this journey, but they went. And then when they finally get there, right, there there was no credit card points or hotels.com to book a stay. They ended up in the manger, and Mary gives birth. And as soon as she does, these like gross, dirty, smelly shepherds show up, right? And they're like, hey, Mary, can we hold the newborn king? And she's like, mm. right? This is a traumatic story still. There wasn't a lot of peace yet. And they don't even have a chance to go back home and finish decorating the nursery before they hear about this order that Herod sent out to kill all the new babies. And they're on the run as fugitives. This wasn't what they planned at all, but there was a purpose. There was a purpose because this child was going to save his people from their sins. A savior was born. This purpose is because of God's love, who God is a God that wants to save his people. And so this morning, if you have been living your life with your own plans and with your own purpose, and you want to say, yes, God, I don't know the plan that you have for me, but I trust in your purpose. I trust in your goodness. If you are at that spot today, I invite you to come talk to Eric and I today during communion after this after this sermon. Come talk to us. We want to pray for you. We want to help you take that step of discovering God's purpose for your life. And so would you pray with me this mo- right now? God of grace, God, we thank you for those times when you've met us, when you met us, when we were going on our own way. We had our own plans, our own agenda. But God, your purpose is greater than anything we could have planned. Because it's your purpose that prevails. God, you are the one that brings hope and healing and redemption in the world. God, right now, we ask that you would heal those times where we felt like we have done the right thing and we've been disappointed. God, you are doing something greater than we can even imagine. God, help us to see that. Give us the eyes to see as you see. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.